Good morning. Today, I sincerely hope that what I share with you will build our relationship with the Lord stronger, but it will also build us together as a community. This is a message that we need to all apply. Of course, every message and every truth in God's word, we need to all apply. But this, in a unique sense, is a message that is important for us as a people of God, as a community, as a family of God, as Utsav. If I were to ask you a question, uh, do you want to be like Judas or do you want to be like Jesus? You know, most professing Christians would find that question even scandalous, find it probably, you know, repulsive or upsetting. The answer would be obviously, Shannon, we want to be like Jesus, nothing close to even remotely close to Judas. But allow me to explain. You know, Jesus uh, one day made a statement to his disciples and it's recorded in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, sorry, Gospel of John, chapter 6, verse 70, 70. And Jesus commenting about Judas Iscariot, one of the 12 disciples who later on betrayed him, said this, did I myself not choose you, the 12, and yet one of you is a devil? Now, that's a very strong statement from our loving Savior. Now, what did Jesus mean? Was Jesus implying that Judas was genetically a devil and not a man. Now, interestingly, Judas, Jesus didn't say Judas had a devil. He said he was a devil. Now, can a devil actually live among people as a human? Now, let us not go wild in our thoughts. You know, when we, when we just take a little bit of effort to read the literal translation of this verse, the word translated as devil, diabolos, is the same word translated elsewhere in the New Testament as a slanderer or a malicious gossiper. And we see that in other references. When I send the notes across, you can look at those references. Now, when Jesus says that Judas is a devil, he's saying that basically one among you, one among you as my disciples, is a false accuser. You're a malicious gossiper. You're a slanderer. The reason being is that Judas had a history of not being able to keep his negative perspective to himself. He would spread it out. Do you remember that uh, remarkable occasion, you know, when Jesus was um, in a house and uh, this, this woman comes and, and breaks the alabaster flask of perfumed oil and she pours it on Jesus' feet and she worships him and she just pours out her devotion and an adoration to God, uh, to the Lord, you know. And uh, what a moment of worship, you know, what an overwhelming moment of worship was that. And as the, as just as the perfume, uh, the fragrance of the perfume filled the room and her devotion filled the room, but here was a man right there in the room, supposed to be one of the disciples of Jesus who makes a big issue about the value of that perfume and what a waste he thought it was. Now, this was just before, you know, Judas made the decision to go to the Pharisees, you know, against Jesus. And uh, this is what he actually said in recording in John 12, 5. He said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And uh, we actually have, a note over there where the author actually says, John says that the reason was not because he was concerned about the poor, but the man had a serious issue with even stealing. He's to steal from what was kept in the treasury box. And so we say here that Judas was a pretty messed up person. And he would not keep his negative perspective to himself. He would, his words would spread strife even among probably the group of disciples. Judas said, in effect, who permitted this thoughtless luxury? Well, it was Jesus himself. The woman had anointed him for his burial, yet to Judas, this was an extravagance that Jesus shouldn't have taken. In the angry mind of Judas now, here was a justification he, had, he was waiting for in order to go against Jesus and go to the chief priests. He thought he had grounds to break ranks with our Lord. Now, here's where I want to now shift gear in my message. What I really want to bring out right now 
is this very important truth that is repeatedly mentioned in scripture in various places. And I'm going to give some references for it, but here's what I want to say as clearly and as simply as scriptures put, put it. God has a major issue with people who are responsible for slander, for people who spread strife and division. And, uh, you know, in, in the book of Proverbs, there is a list of people who, or a list of things that the Lord hates, you know, and, and one that he says is an abomination. Out of that list of seven, you know, almost four have to do with, with spreading strife and spreading discord and causing division among the brethren. Now, here's, here's the point as we dwell on this and try to understand this better, but we're going to end this on a good note. You know, we're going to end this always with a biblical solution, a godly solution. But before I go there, let's just dwell on this for a, for a couple of minutes. And here's the point. Betrayal, coming to a place of breaking ranks, getting divisive is not a sudden thing. It is a result of accumulated offense and unresolved hurts and anger. Now, the Bible says very clearly, be angry, but do not sin. So there is space in the grace of God, in the kingdom of God, where we do get angry, we can get upset. And especially in this world where we all are imperfect, we can surely be uh, having experiences where we hurt one another. I have hurt people. I have let down people. And uh, people have been gracious to forgive me. So yes, we do hurt one another. We can disappoint one another. But we have this, you know, abundance of grace of God, where we learn to process that, we learn to find, uh, you know, godly loving solutions to that and see that there is no place, as Paul warns us, for the enemy to come inside. Now, the issue is when we do not transfer those offenses to God in prayer, in sudden, and that inevitably leads to decay and becomes poison, venom, that we transfer to others through gossip. In the process, we embrace slander and we feel justified. We become malicious gossips, but in our minds, we have psyched ourselves with the, with the help of the enemy, think, thinking that we're only communicating a truth, a character flaw that we self-righteously discerned. To understand Judas's betrayal of Jesus, we must unearth its source. Judas Iscariot was a grumbler. He was, a, he was a consistent grumbler. He always had an issue about everything, you know. And uh, when we lose sight of the many things for which we should be thankful, we become murmurers and complainers, increasingly darkened by a thought life that is engineered by the enemy. So the point is this, beloved that what I'm trying to bring forth here is a choice that we need to make. One is that we can choose to be thankful. And I want to dwell on that more in just a, just a couple of minutes, but we have to make a choice that on the other hand, because on the other hand is grumbling, murmuring, then getting further into malicious gossiping, slandering, and then we become, we can become agents of the enemy to cause division in relationships and in the community. But I know that we are children of God and by the grace of God, we will make the wise choice of not going down this road of, of decay and death, but we will make the good choice of, of walking in this beautiful gift and grace of thankfulness. Now, just to help us, we need to be aware when we have anger towards another brother, sister, or any other person who's probably not even a Christian that has, that has led us to gossip about him or her, especially if you are embittered and are now sowing criticisms about him or her to others. Yes, beware, because we are no longer, if, if you're doing that, being conformed to Christ. But as I asked that, uh, mentioned that controversial question at the start, do you want to be like Judas? Or do you want to be like Jesus? You see, if I am beginning to exhibit a pattern of continuously criticizing a person, you know, there is, it is evidence that there is a root of bitterness that I need to deal with. And I need to deal it with prayer. I need to de deal it with, you know, em embracing, uh, you know, the gospel in that area of my life, the work of the cross, 
where in the divine exchange, I can give my anger, I can give my bitterness to the Lord and he can give me his abundant supply of healing and love for myself and for that concerned person. Beloved, in simple words, in order to not walk in the path of unresolved hurt, unresolved anger that leads to offense and then us beginning to gossip about people and then us becoming agents or ambassadors of division, we need to pause right there and say, Lord, I want to choose thankfulness. I want to choose gratitude. When we just did that good choice, we actually declared war against grumbling and murmuring. And that's a good thing. So here's the point, beloved. I want, I want to say something in, in, in as clear as I can. I have failed the Lord many times in all these years in this area of my life. I have sinned against the Lord so many times and he's been gracious to convict me and always to bring me back to making the good choice. You know, I, I would say in, in, in humility over your honesty, my Farah did far better than me in, in especially this area of, 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 of her life. Uh, she was a very forgiving person. You know, very rarely she would mention to me that she was upset with somebody or upset about something. And, uh, you know, without exaggerating, she would mention it once and it would not be mentioned again because either that night or the very next morning, she had dealt with it in prayer. I have been the one who has struggled, you know, days, weeks, sometimes months on things, you know, where you've kind of pushed it at the back of your mind and then it just surfaces when there is an incident that happens, you know. And I feel the Lord, but I'm believing God for his grace that I will do better. You know, the Lord has sustained me, but I want to come to a place where he strengthens me to be a true worshiper who cannot afford to be a grumbler, a murmurer, and not be an agent of division, but to be a worshiper with a grateful heart, choosing thanksgiving in every situation. Don't forget, beloved, the good promise that we have, that all things work out together for the good to those who love God and who are called according to his purpose. You know, one great encouragement in my life has been King David. Just look at the way he was pursued. We looked at his life a little bit last week, you know, when we spoke about the Lord being our stronghold. And we saw how this man was pursued, pursued by, the, by Saul. And we know this, you know, if you're familiar with this story, you know, how King Saul actually tried to spear him three times, tried to kill uh, this, this young man. And when he was innocent, he had not done anything. But what would have happened to David if he had pulled out that spear and flung it back at Saul? Well, that would have been getting even. But you know what? You would not have the David that today we know of. He would have been transformed and morphed into something else. Beloved, we are not called to give back. We're not called to do tit for tat. We're called to be worshipers. Vindication belongs to the Lord. The Lord will repay. We are called to walk in forgiveness, in gratitude, in worship, and, and let the Lord do what he has to do. So here's, here's the point. You know, can we do this together? Can we, as a community, make a choice to say, we don't want to be malicious gossips. We don't want to be slanderers. We don't want to be people who are agents of strife and division in the community or in our families or in our workplaces. We want to be peacemakers. Remember, you know, it requires such grace and such maturity to be a peacemaker. And, you know, God's called us to be peacemakers. And here's the simple, beautiful truth. It's a thankful heart that sees the best part or the better part in every situation, in every person. We've received too much from God. We've received so much from God for ourselves, you know, uh, that we should not give in to ingratitude and unbelief. We have received too many gifts and privileges to allow grumbling to disqualify us from our destiny. So beloved, we need to remind ourselves that we need to see problems and weaknesses as opportunities for us to grow in Christ and become like Christ. You know, my prayer for each of us is that we would possess the abundant life that Jesus died and rose again to give us. And so here's the, here's the thing. You know, Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, 9 to 10. He says, let us, uh, nor let us grumble as Israel did and were destroyed by the destroyer. 1 Corinthians 10, 9 and 10. He says this, I've, I've compressed uh, those two verses and taken apart. And he basically says this, nor let us grumble as Israel did 
and were destroyed by the destroyer. One of the uh, biggest issues that God had with Israel is that they would frequently grumble and murmur. And eventually, it cost an entire generation them entering into the promised land. And you see, God uh, is not moved by numbers. If it's the minority that's on his side, he goes with the minority, or rather the minority stays with him. God will not be moved just because more people choose to disobey him. And, and what was the result that happened to Israel? An entire generation was stopped from entering the promised land, except for two people. That was Joshua and Caleb. We know that if you're familiar with the story. And so my point is this, beloved. The reason that entire generation could not enter in is because of this dangerous sin of grumbling and murmuring. Let me tell you. Let me remind myself and each of us this morning. Grumbling and murmuring can have serious consequences in God. It, it tears down uh, our relationship with God. It tears down our relationships with people. It causes, uh, it tears down each, uh, the community. It's got serious consequences. And so, beloved, my encouragement is that we will not give in to gossip and murmuring and slandering, but we will choose uh, thankfulness. You know, if, if, if we have been part of something that we should not have been part of, we should have been part of conversations that we should not have been part of, it's time for us to acknowledge and ask God to forgive us because he is gracious, he's forgiving, you know. But uh, more than that, even beyond that, we should ask God for the grace do not in the future be part of these things. Let us be part of, of good conversations, of fun, of clean jokes, of uh, edifying conversations that build us up in God, of loving conversations. And even if you have to discuss something that's of concern about somebody, it must be done in a very prayerful, it must be done in a very specific uh, uh, manner that brings about healing, that brings about solution, that ushers in the kingdom of God, not spreading uh, negativity, especially false things about people. And so here, you know, Paul tells us to fix our minds on things above. In Colossians 3, 1, he says that, let your mind be set on things above. You know, when we make that good choice of thanking God, our minds get set on God. Our mind gets set on the things of God. So Philippians 4, 8, he says this, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, is right whatever is pure, whatever is lovely and of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. You know, Bilawar, I want to say this and, and, and I'm saying it in the context of, you know, um, you know, be, have friends around you who will help you in this, who will help you to think on and have conversations what is true and what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely, what is good repute. If there's any excellence is worthy of praise, you know. I remember years back, you know, Faranbi would uh, sometimes go and meet these couple of friends, you know, because they had done some good things for us. They had been there when we needed them. And, uh, you know, over, over a period of time, uh, we kind of, you know, drifted a little away. So we wanted to go and spend time with them and we'd go spend time with them. And, uh, but every time we noticed that, every time we would come back, you know, our heads would be heavy, our hearts would be heavy, we're not refreshed. And the reason being is because there was so much of negativity that was in the conversation because they kept talking about others. They kept talking about people that didn't concern us. They kept speaking negative things about people and almost the entire evening would be self-righteousness. You know, we are so good, everyone's so bad. And we had to make a difficult choice of staying away. And beloved, I want to say this to us as, as Utsav as a community, you know, to pursue the things of God. Sometimes we have to make hard choices in order to strengthen our, you know, protect our relationship with God, in order to protect our families, in order to protect our communities. You know, sometimes we have to stay away from certain kinds of people. You know, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, not stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of what is scornful. If you've been thinking that love requires that I'm obligated to sit with anybody and hear everything and anything, you're wrong. Godliness expects us to make even decisions about the nature and quality of the relationships that we have in our life. You know, so beloved, I want to encourage us to choose the blessed life. I want to encourage us to choose the, the, the path that is full of thanksgiving and gratitude and, and worshiping God and, you know, strengthening the community rather than going the Judas way. So wait, now, 
towards the end of the message, you, you know, it could be that somebody, one of you may ask a genuine question, you know, but Shannon, who will point out when things are wrong, you know, when things are wrong? I, I, I'll tell you what, I think you know the answer. You know, first, let me say this, that there are plenty of volunteers for that task, you know, but here's the question is that how can I attain the blessed life that Jesus came to give me? Now, if there is a genuine issue, then you have to talk to either the concerned person or you have to talk to a leader or a person in that context that could be, could be your family, it could be your workplace, it could be the church. You have to talk to the person who has the authority, a God-given authority, an organizational authority or a relational authority who can do something about it. You don't talk to people who have nothing to do about it. So that's the simple answer to the question. And that's the way I've not gotten to the scripture verses for that, but it's pretty simple when you look at the gospels and when you look at the New Testament uh, episodes, it's pretty clear. We don't talk to people about things that don't concern them. We talk to only those uh, about a matter that concerns them that they can do something about it. That's the best way to keep negativity uh, and issues under control in the grace of God under the Lordship of Jesus. You know, so beloved, you know, here is the, here's the thing. Let's, let's choose life. You know, let's choose, uh, let's choose to be more like Jesus. Uh, let's choose to be a people who are blessed and who would want to be a blessing. And for that, we have to walk away from gossip. We have to walk away from uh, slander. We have to walk away from even people maybe at times who are divisive and, and surrender them to God. Let God deal with them. You know, God is not far away. He loves every one of his children and he, and he, he can deal with things that are unrighteous. Let us make the good choice to walk in love, to walk in truth, to walk in forgiveness, to walk in the spirit of unity where, where we consider the others better than ourselves, where we look at the good things that are there in the lives of people and celebrate that. And if there are things that we can't change, we can't change everyone, uh, you know, but we, we can surely entrust them to God. God can change that. So let us not get bothered about things that we can't change. Let's surrender those things to God and let us make the good choice to be like Jesus. Let us declare war on ungratefulness and grumbling by choosing thankfulness. And when we do that, our relationship with God will be stronger. Our relationships with one another, our relationships with our family members in our workplaces will be stronger. Amen. Let's make that good choice. Uh, and God bless you and have a blessed week.